<laughs> All right. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Sean Holman. I'm with uh, Motor Train Group. Uh, I'm the content director for the Truck and Off-Road Group, as well as a uh, co-host uh, for the Truck Show podcast. And with me today is my really good friend, Gail Banks. And uh, we're going to do a little SEMA Young Executive Networks uh, exactly. chat here at lunchtime. Exactly. So uh, I've got a list of questions that, uh, that people pre-gamed for you. So I All figured right. that we would go through these and, and kind of get your take on, uh, let's share that wisdom. How, how long have you been in the industry for now? 61 years in business and 65 years as a hot rodder. Only, only so. 65? Only 65. <laughs> <laughs> so you, what you're saying is you, you, uh, you'll have to uh, what I'm saying figure is, out some things to talk about today. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I've got the first question here. It doesn't say who the questions have come from. So um, right. if uh, hopefully uh, they're, they're watching us right now. What's the single most effective marketing move that you've made with your company? In over six decades, I can imagine that marketing has changed quite a bit from when you started to today's world. Yeah, it's changed, but it's the same. Uh, you have a product and you want to emphasize the advantages of your product over your competitor's product. For me, it's always been project-based. In other words, when we started out, we were very much in the racing engine business. And one way to show that you had some chops and your engines had some chops was to go out and compete. So we would do that but not in a series necessarily, although we did those in boat racing, but the salt flats or set a quarter mile record, uh, those sorts of things, and then back away and offer what you had to everybody else. In other words, don't race your customers has always been my motto. So through the years, and of course, the advent of the internet has really helped us get that out there. People enjoy uh, watching what you're up to. And in the racing engine business, and I think it's the same today, there were companies that had acronyms for names, a bunch of letters or letters and numbers or those sorts of things. Same with trademarks. I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, those aren't memorable. So the other part of it was, uh, against the advice of my father, uh, who had been in a couple of businesses and being a perfectionist, put himself out of business. Sure. Perfection at a commercial price is very hard to do, uh, and, and especially at his level. But one piece of advice he gave me, and I heeded it early on, was, you be uh, anonymous in your business. Uh, don't put your name on the business. People will know <laughs> who to call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I soon realized that that people, uh, if you're in the racing engine business or the speed equipment business, people associated with an individual. Right. They want to identify that there's a human element. It's not a you know, if you get big enough, you don't want to be a conglomerate or this big, massive corporation that doesn't have a human face that exactly. isn't humanized to the customer. So present a lot of companies, nobody wants to be that individual. Or maybe it's different in the performance industry. Uh, but ultimately, what's happening today that seem, seems to be destroying this is most companies have no face. Uh, there's nobody who presents themselves, especially if you're demonstrating your product or demonstrating its capabilities in a direct comparison done honestly with others' capabilities. Most people don't want to do that. They want to stay away from that. Uh, well, I'm a racer. I want to develop products that win in the marketplace, number one, and know that that, that happened by using our own test protocols on all the competition. So in a and, sense, and, you, you've taken the, the idea of racing and putting yourself out there from your early days in the company mm -hmm. and have modified it for today's world by 
being able to bench test and do different tests and engineering or, tests and validate or, or internally. Build, build that project, mm -hmm. build, build that Bonneville car, build that offshore boat. And you're not whatever. afraid of calling somebody out because it pushes everybody forward, but it's no different than racing somebody on the well, racetrack where everybody can see yeah. them. Uh, we're, we're drifting off a little bit here, but in some cases, especially in the performance industry, we want to be emissions compliant. Yeah. We want to be not of trouble to the OEMs. We want to honor that host vehicle with our equipment, mm -hmm. not destroy it. Uh, I'd like to say, you invite me over for dinner. I come to your house. You serve me a beautiful dinner, and then I go out in the kitchen. Let me help you with the dishes, and I break every dish in the kitchen. <laughs> That's my comparison that in a social atmosphere. Sure. I'm, I'm not going to invite you to purchase our products, put them on your vehicle, and then the products make your vehicle illegal or destroy your vehicle ultimately because the equipment is gradually damaging the vehicle while you drive. And, and of, course, of course, my bailiwick is the powertrain, the technical aspect. So direct demonstration and also, also today through social media, uh, bring people inside. Uh, we started our YouTube channel originally as Banks Insider. Mm -hmm. uh, it's evolved into Banks Power. Uh, but the whole idea was share out how we're doing this stuff. There's a lots of guys out there who want to know that and really get a kick out of it. So no matter what your product, uh, demonstrate it and give honest numbers. A lot of power numbers, mileage numbers, Aren't, don't, don't come from the guys out in the shop who develop your products in some companies. They come from the marketing group. Well, you had a recent video um, that is a great example where you compared your product to a competitor's product. And they had certain claims that were done at the peak and their marketing team marketed those claims. And when you validated their product against your mm -hmm. product, yes, that peak was there, but it was there for like a split second or a couple of seconds. Whereas you may have either met that peak or been slightly below it, but you've yeah. lasted the entire run, or you didn't do anything to go, you know, blow past EGTs and safety. You know, your products have always had that safeguard in in place to make sure that, like you said, you're not going, you're honoring the host vehicle by not damaging or destroying the host vehicle. Yeah, and even more important, uh, we we pioneered the turbocharging uh, concept. Uh, we started turbocharging back in the late. 60s, and I've been an advocate of turbocharging since the late 50s. Uh, I just had to learn about it and how to do it. And, and our engines back then were primarily for boats, uh, pleasure boats, ski boats, but the Catalina Ski Race, which was basically an endurance race with a skier behind you. Yeah. Uh, we started winning that. Uh, then we got into offshore racing. and world-class and we did very well there. What I'm talking about is from this company's core, we know about engine durability and we know what makes an in engine durable and what kills engines. Um, so when I see somebody in the industry de destroying our opportunities in the industry, by putting out illegal product or product that damages your, your engine and product that makes power for eight to, ten sec eight to 10 seconds, and then the management system in, in the host the vehicle comes pulls, and pulls it, it back, takes yeah. it away. Sure. Uh, they, they just don't know what the hell they're up to. Uh, know what you're up to. Uh, <laughs> but second, if you're in the marketing side of things, drive the engineering or development guys to develop something and give you the numbers and then claim those help numbers. Help them help you create the narrative. Exactly. So the, the more you know more about the overall picture rather than just these peak numbers, the more uh, complete your picture can be for a customer. Yeah. Um, so I want to pivot off that for a moment.
And I want to go we're, to... We're, we're still on one question. Like, I know. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I'm sure people are, uh, are, are wondering. Uh, they have so many questions today, so I want to fit them all in. All right. One of the next ones is, how has government contracts impacted your enthusiast business? You talk about durability, and you talk about, you know, I don't know if people realize that you actually have a robust military side of your business mm-hmm. that actually that, that um, experience and knowledge that you've gained from those contracts in vehicles that have been used in the, in the harshest of environments have helped you define a better product for your enthusiast customer. Well, uh, uh, yeah, harsh environments. <laughs> uh, you know, you got to cold start this engine at 50 below zero with no starting fluid, no block heater. You know, that's, that's harsh. Uh, and yes, we've done that. The, we, we've been doing military engines since 1976. So what is that, 40 some years? Uh, and we always gravitated more to the special forces needs. They needed high performance, they needed range, uh, they needed durability, those sorts of things. Uh, that's helped us because it drove our, the quality of our aftermarket, uh, the durability of our aftermarket products, and still does. Uh, that all paid off. Uh, oh, back in '03, we started uh, pursuing a contract for the to power the vehicle that replaces the uh, Humvee, the military Humvee. And you guys may know it as the JLTV. It's called the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, and a Banks uh, version of the Duramax. Uh, supply, uh, we're, we're the exclu- exclusive supplier. By the way, it is a Banks version of that engine. You maybe talk to people about w- what makes it a Banks engine because there's actually quite a few differences in that engine versus just a Duramax off the shelf. Yeah, to get the, to get the engine to do uh, what the, uh, the, 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 there was a definition of a minimum uh, performance right. metrics. Uh, that we had to at least hit. Well, I wanted to exceed all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so basically, the engine that's built, we're, we actually, when we started all this back in the early 2000s, we helped Lockheed Martin with their Cummins. Uh, we represented Duramax. They came to us from 0304 GM and said, Will you represent our engine uh, and develop the engine management to, to run it and all that? Little did we know the engine needed to be more specialized and more specialized, specialized as assembled on the line uh, at Duramax. So our parts that we designed for the engine, uh, the lower crankcase, the oil sump, uh, that, that goes on and on and yeah. on. Uh, what can be installed at Duramax, we ship those parts into the line and they, they ins- install them. So our engines have our own part numbers. You can't buy them at a dealership. Then it comes here to California and we add uh, 270 other pieces uh, and run a 22 minute dyno test on every one. All, the, all of this meeting their records keeping the, the quality ISO, all of that, brought all that brought us up to to where the entire com- company. There's an umbrella impact on the uh, high tide company. raises all ships, right? Yeah. Oddly, Banks Technologies, a company we formed in the '80s to do computer science-based automotive control products. Uh, we ultimately, I, I didn't want the uh, computer guys, the double E is uh, t- to be in with the mechanical guys. And now I know that that was a mistake. We started this other com- company to keep them apart. I, sh- I soon folded it back in. And uh, t- today, that high tech company is the engine company, but, you know, separate books for military. So high tech, we're talking mm-hmm. about taking a uh, engine platform and making it more robust using your parts. Mm-hmm. Those parts have helped 
influence your enthusiast business by giving you well, knowledge about durability yes. and all those types of things. Mind you, the Duramax is already robust. It's, it's a great, obviously well, a great platform. But you have to, to run with. the engines at wild-ass angles <laughs> and do, yeah. do, do G-loads and things you'd never do with a pickup truck. Yeah. So obviously the market is changing. Electrification, yeah. hybrid technology. What new technologies in the industry are you excited most about? I mean, I think you started and you were racing gasoline. You dabbled in superchargers. You went mm -hmm. to turbochargers. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, uh, you sort of became the diesel and turbocharger guy. Then you Late became 70s, the, yeah. Then you became the pickup diesel guy. And, yeah. and now you're still the turbocharger guy. So banks, you know, I don't know if people realize that you do a ton of gas stuff as well. It's not just about diesel. Well, we never stopped gasoline. Right. Yeah. And so you have dabbled in multiple technologies over the course of your career in the 61 years that the company's mm -hmm. been in business. So looking at the horizon, you've played with superchargers and turbochargers and different fuels and different configurations of engine. What mm -hmm. are you seeing that excites you the most? And what do you think has the most enthusiast potential moving forward? Okay. Uh, I'm quite excited by pure electrics. Uh, but hybrids, uh, oh, back in the 08, 09, BMW asked us to uh, evaluate what was called the Hybrid 7, mm -hmm. which was a V8 twin turbo, uh, serious uh, IC engine with a motor generator un unit where the flywheel and Basically is. one of those pancake motors between the transmission and the Mot uh, and crank. But, but mind you, motor generator. Okay. So when you ask, when you put the loud pedal down, you got it all. You got the electrification and you got that twin turbo V8, we, which directly drove the wheels, making it the prime mover of choice. And the other stuff uh, gives you a boost it gives you uh, energy re, uh, regen, yep. uh, so you you can charge the battery on D cell, those sorts of things. And the one I'd like to do is one wherein I can declutch the motor generator unit, to turn off the engine, and drive pure electric. That you couldn't do with that that hybrid seven back then, but. Testing that really lit me off on hybrid. I think we have quite a opportunity building in hybrid hybrids. I know I know to be politically correct, all the car companies will want to have pure electrics. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, there. and we we could argue the. The benefits in another chat. I think that you know, with well, technology, it has to be a tapestry. It's not going to be one thing, and it sure. depends on what your use case is, right? Here's the deal. Uh, a friend of mine died recently, Sid Mead. He was a visual futurist. Yeah. Uh, he did the uh, visual futurescape for Blade Runner and Tron, and more recently, the uh, Star Wars exhibit at Disney, uh, and. He and I had a lot of discussions and, and, you know, there's this visualization of the future wherein it's austere, it's cold, there's nothing old. But the, the fact, and, and Sid visited me with this years and years ago, I'm looking at one of his images and there's this car that's arrived at a social gathering and people are getting in and out of the car. And oh, by the way, the, the car is, is hovering above the ground. <laughs> and they're, they're going into this club. In the background is a 64 Lincoln four door. Yeah, Continental with the suicide door. Yes. Yeah. Black. And, 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 and I went, well, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> the, this, con this contravenes my vision of the future. Right. He says, well, your vision of the future is wrong. The future is comprised, and I love this, of everything that existed up to the word now. Right. Right. And defining what goes beyond the word now has been my entire life. I'm a futurist as well. That's why Sid and I got along all those decades. The future you know. isn't austere. The future is going to have those old cars. Those old cars you know, are there. Mixed in with the now, pods. Now, the people interested <laughs> the in driverless them. pods. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. 
I'll be driving a 67 F100 next to the driverless pod in the future because mm -hmm. I'm not giving up my steering wheel. All of that, the maintenance of all of those things, that's Yestertech. Yeah. I'm more involved and care more about future tech. Okay, so Give me uh, another one. <laughs> here's a good one from uh, from Caesar. Uh, says, "Hey, Gail, as you begin to introduce new products not originally equipped, the intercooler for the Super Duty, for instance, how have these relationships with the OEs changed over time?" Products not originally equipped. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one. Caesar, huh? Uh huh. All right. <laughs> uh, back in the mid '80s, a guy named John Rock took over GMC, and he got a hold of me, probably through some magazine guys, and he says, I'm coming out for the International Car Show at Anaheim, truck show, truck show at Anaheim, uh, and I want, I want to have breakfast with you and talk about some stuff. So I went down to Anaheim, and uh, had, we sat down for breakfast, and he says, I got two problems. Um, my diesel... 6.2 liter diesel trucks. This is 85, 86. Uh, there were no turbo diesel trucks. Uh, he says, Ford's come out with their 6.9 and they're just kicking my ass. And uh, you're turbocharging our, our 6.2 diesels. And I don't see you in my warranty numbers. Now, don't violate the host vehicle. <laughs> right. Uh, for, and for you'll example. get, you know. yeah. And he says, so. I want you to help me save the, the, not the Duramax plant, but the diesel engine plant in Marine, Ohio. We're down to 17% capacity. Cummins is getting cozy with Dodge. Um, Ford, Ford's tied up International Harvester. I don't have an a alternative diesel that, that is the size. And, we have to continue making our, our own engine or discontinue diesel pickups and Suburbans, which would have been a huge mistake. Sure. So how about you set up a program with us where you turbocharge our trucks and our Suburbans? We'll ship them to you. You ship them back to us. It'll be a ship through. Mm -hmm. Set up something near Flint, Michigan, where we have a truck plant. So we did something over in Almont, and, and uh, the first turbocharged diesel pickups that you could buy in an agent city had banks uh, on the turbocharging equipment under the hood. People don't realize this. Well, it was GMC you, only, but, but it you, was 1988. You beat Cummins. We beat the Cummins turbo pickup by yep. a year. A full year, which is which so, is an amazing story. Not only did you beat what people often think is the first factory turbocharged pickup, mm -hmm. which it wasn't, mm -hmm. the the uh, GMC with your turbocharger, right. but the fact that you were able to have Banks branding under the hood well, was that a bit was, of a coup for you. Well, the, and the brand there was an add-on. He wanted to get into the sport truck business. We were doing sport trucks here in California, and I, and I said, uh, you know, I'm in, interested in helping you with that. You help me brand my brand under the, the hood of your vehicle. And he says, okay, here's the deal. I'll do that. We've never done it before. It, it's going to be hard to push through. Uh, and it was. Uh, but you warranty your product directly. You do the marketing for the program. I'll give you some trucks. And what we got was three new Suburbans. Uh, four by fours, and you go out to the de dealer body, yada yada yada, and you get to keep your name on the stuff. And I said, done. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I'll do all that. Yeah. We were in a number of magazines. The the best one was in Motor Trend, where when the turbo diesels came out from the others, including the eventual GM turbo diesel. They compared our turbo diesel to all the others, and we were still the quickest. Yeah. We didn't have the best fuel economy, though. <laughs> <laughs> so then we, we did this other thing. This was a demonstration. We managed 
the Bonneville effort to set, set a new record for pickup trucks. Yep. Uh, it was 144 set by a Jeep driven by Mickey Thompson way back when. Uh, and we went, first year we went 194 and the second year 204. Is that all? And it became, <laughs> it became known as the Cyclone. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the brand it, it's funny we I mean on. we have a bunch of questions to get to but we could be here all day talking about the history because well these guys aren't here <laughs> there's so many things that, yeah, that intertwine guys, with each of these stories what is the uh, your outlook on the future of hot rodding do you see it growing or slowing down at all well there's there's there I, I mentioned yester tech and future tech yester tech is a noble cause there are better looking hot rods We've got to leave the rat rods out of this statement. Uh, all our, all, all of everything we built back in the day uh, was generally more rat rod than it was what, what you see today, yeah. beautiful paint, you know, all of that. We didn't have the money for that. Uh, we really wanted to go fast, uh, and that was the prime thing. Uh, and, and, and attract women with our hot rods. <laughs> Did it work? So, <laughs> no, <laughs> but we thought it worked. Yeah, right. We thought that the loud pipes were <laughs> directly connected. To, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you hit that, huh? everybody looks. That's right. No, that's a dream. So, Yestertech, I have a warm feeling for all of that, but it's not a technical challenge. It's more of a nostalgia business. And the people involved in Yestertech, and there are a lot of them, uh, don't really have a long future prospect, uh, and this 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 has this has to do with the difficulty of future tech is is very difficult. You really have to have individuals within your business that are capable of reverse engineering, or as I like to say, hacking automobiles and trucks. Uh, so, Yestertech is far easier. You can refine what stuff looked like, you, you know, those, those sorts of things. Future tech is tough. But it's safe to say, I would, I would imagine, that the hot rodder, the, despite the platform and technology changing, isn't a dying breed. People are always going to want to tweak and go faster and Automotive have Automotive enthusiasm, well, there's an, you, you've got a consumer demographic there. Uh, a lot of younger folks that are currently going to college uh, or a lot of, of younger folks don't even have a car all the way through high school. Yeah. Uh, so our population is increasing. The car enthusiast population is maybe stabilizing. Yeah. But it's a massive country. And, we'll, and our consumer base is huge. There's an ocean to swim in here. So don't let me discourage you. All right, I got one from uh, our friend uh, Matt Beenan. And Matt says, what advice do you have for an aftermarket business with an opportunity to work directly with an OEM? The necessary qualifications and standards present a significant cost and challenge, but it sounds like you found those to be ultimately beneficial across your business. Can you elaborate on how those, rela those relationships transformed your business? Okay, so starting in 1969, this isn't known, uh, this isn't common knowledge. Uh, we do contract engineering. Uh, uh, our first one was, was valve gear design for marine engine applications for Chevrolet, and that was back in 1969. Uh, also an oiling system, high dynamics, marine environment, uh, oiling system. Uh, we got into diesel uh, bec because they were coming out with a 6.2 engine that they had, Oldsmobile, had, Oldsmobile did a catastrophic uh, engine program where they repurposed a gasoline engine and dieselized it. Yep. <laughs> and, and they, some of that confidence came from early 70s, Olds uh, approached us to build an endurance marine engine, uh, marine engine out of their 455 V8 and try to win 
the American Power Boat Association and the National Jet Boat Association uh, championships, and also to win the jet boat division at the Parker Nine Hour Endurance Race. Uh, at that point, a guy who was a drag racer of uh, Oldsmobiles um, and a, a fellow Californian and friend uh, couldn't make one live a 20 minute sprint race mm. in, in a boat. And he and his wife were driving new Oldsmobiles and, you know, he was a full pro program. I never got, my wife never got a car, <laughs> uh, but we, we did the program and we won the Parker nine hour and we won both national championships for Oldsmobile. So they thought the stuff we had done with our high compression gasoline endurance engine made their engine a diesel capable. Well, man, I argued with them, but it happened anyway. Then the G GM wanted to do it right, so they partnered with Detroit Diesel and they did the 6.2. Right. And the 6.2, by today's standards, it's still kind of a light duty thing. The guys over at Chevrolet and products or special products is it, that was the racing or, or the high perform, performance guys back then. They, they, they asked me to evaluate the 6.2 with turbo, twin turbos, a very high horsepower output against, to market against the 3208 cap. Well, well, the engines, that engine, the 6.2, is too fragile for that. Uh, so we didn't uh, do the marine engine, but Pontiac was doing a new Firebird for 1982 year model, late 81 introduction. And around 1980, I, it, it, it was asked, uh, could we run one at the Salt Flats? We, we had the door slammer record at 240 with, with a 68 Corvette twin turbo. And um, so I got a call from John Chanella, who was the designer, the chief design, and Bob Dorn, who was the chief engineer there uh, at the time. And, they said, hey, we're looking, we're looking at this 240 sporty article that Tom Center put in popular hot rodding on the Corvette. How'd you like to go 20 miles an hour faster? I said, you got, you got my attention. <laughs> and, and well, all you have to do is put your powertrain in our car. And I said, what car? Well, there's one waiting for you at the GM Proving Grounds, Tempe, Arizona. So I went and got it, had to keep it covered and GMC said, hey, we've got the, this pickup truck coming out with this new diesel. I said, I know about the diesel. Well, we're going to give you two of them to use as support trucks, a one-ton dually and a half-ton short bed or whatever that was at the time. And um, I said, great. Well, the first time we tried to pull the enclosed trailer with a Firebird in it over to Vegas, it, no boy. By not. the time I got to the thermometer, you know about the oh, thermometer, yeah. big, top yeah, bigger, of Baker bigger grade. grade yeah. From here to there, it went so slow up the grade. By the time I got there, I had to, I had to shave. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I never have rock the beard. So, so what's shaving? You know, I mean, it took a while. <laughs> it took a while to get up that grade. So I thought, we need to turbocharge this thing. So we. Turbocharged both of them. It took about six six Saturdays of coming in and cobbling the pieces up. Then I went. Well, by the time these trucks trucks are on the market, we could tool this stuff. So when the trucks came out, uh, within a few months, we had a turbo package for those trucks. And that that basically came about because of your relationship you had previously with another branded General well, Motors. Those, you know, they kind of parlayed well, themselves Pontiac, into these things. Uh, yeah. Understand, the GMC headquarters is in Pontiac, right. Michigan. So, and and if you if we weren't sound, Chevy trucks were sold by Chevrolet. Other divisions didn't have yeah. a truck, so they got GMC trucks. Yeah. If you were an Olds dealer, you got. So Pontiac dealers had GMC. Natural linkage between the two. 
But that is the formation of, that is the seminal product of the entire diesel aftermarket. Is that? Is your bad experience of towing yes. up the Baker grade I-15 outside of California yes. or Los Angeles on the way to Vegas. Necessity is the mother of invention. So would you say that the resources that you spent, because obviously people weren't paying for all this. This was some of this was you on your own time saying, I'm going to make this better. Those resources, that time that you put into the business to capture the attention of the OE ultimately paid off, not only with your own products, but by forming a completely new category within the automotive aftermarket. I mean, it's, that's. It turned out to be, I couldn't go, go to the SEMA show with that stuff. They, they didn't want, <laughs> guys with diesels didn't go into speed shops. Right. It was fully 10 years. Boy, is that different now. Before I showed it at yeah. SEMA. Yeah. You know, it was like 82, 90, 92. I, I took diesel to SEMA mm -hmm. for the first time. And of course, it's, it saved the industry, in my opinion. So we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's How about a, employment questions? Yeah. Or, yeah. So this one I especially like. It's uh, what's the biggest piece of advice can you give to a young professional who's entering the automotive industry in 2020? Okay. If you're entering the autom automotive industry, you're either going to be a sole proprietor or, or start your own company. But, but to the general audience, you're going to be working for somebody. Choose your employer well. That's, consider this. You're going to go to, to, to a company to build your skill set and make yourself more valuable to, to that company, company or other companies. That's just how it is. I'm, I've been in business, this is my 62nd year actually, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, that I'm in, and, and people have come here, and it, I have to talk about hiring as well <laughs> as an aside, but I try to find people who are so smart and so capable that they can, they could take my job. That's a good way to hire. But it's also a bad way to hire in this respect. <laughs> They, this company uh, has constantly been growing since for 62 years. Despite the fact that we're also a training ground or school. You could name a handful of organizations that people have graduated to. We call, we call them the graduates. Yeah. And one of the guys that works here who's now been here 43, 44 years, Bob Rogue, used to keep a list of the graduates guys that resigned and went to work for other companies. And some major or companies. Or start their own companies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are graduates at SEMA. Mm -hmm. At That's the SEMA, SEMA headquarters. Yeah. yeah, there are banks graduates yep. there. So, or people who passed through here when, when, when they were, you, you know. Interning or, or. Or the magazine in, yep. industry was collapsing or consolidating and they suddenly didn't have something to do. Hey, Old friends mm -hmm. come here for a while, and uh, the the bottom line is, once you've chosen a company and they're entering interviewing you, but you should be interviewing them. What's your growth plans here, etc.? Be brave about this. Uh, get them to sell you their company, while you're selling them your skill set or or your capabilities. If it's today, 2020, huh, it's the seller's market. You're selling your skill set and you're you're rare. Most most people are be employed. assertive. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It, and if you get into the company, you land that position and the society within in the company isn't it your thing. Uh, or it, the, the, the company doesn't fit your ethics, uh, whatever it is, get the hell out of there. Find your fit socially within the company, ethically within the company, uh, and make yourself more valuable by when, once you're in the company by a asking 
for tasks that, that help the company with it, its goals and help you with your goals. And your goals are to make yourself more expensive. <laughs> yeah. And it's more my valuable. responsibility to compensate people, people who do that. Uh, and then ultimately guys will, will evolve out of a group and, and become the leader of the group. That's worth more money too. All right, uh, we have one more question here. Time for one more. This is probably my favorite uh, question out of all of these. Um, you're a futurist. You like to time, to time travel, let's say. Uh, what is the one piece of advice your current self would give your young self back when you started your career? If you could go back in time right now with all the knowledge that you have now, what would be the one piece of advice that you would impart on young Gail Banks? Hmm. And did young Gail Banks think cars would be flying in 2020? Oh, here it is. Here <laughs> it is. I'll tell you. I'm a technical futurist. Okay. But I'm a businessman. And the advice I'd give myself is those liberal arts classes that I didn't care much for, like English composition, uh, history, uh, <laughs> And most important, accounting. Man, you want you want to have business chops, yeah. Yeah, a full rounded thing. And I was not. I, I wasn't lazy about it. I just didn't consider it important until I made some money, and then it became very important. Yeah. And communicating with people. You know, we used to write letters and put stamps on envelopes and send this doc document to people. And wait a few days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that document either impressed and so sold what you were selling, uh, whether it's a relationship or a product or, or a service. Uh, communication, excellence in communication, clear, concise communication uh, that gets to the point and accounting, my God, thank God. I was racing uh, in board the Parker nine hour. The faster boats were not jets, they were V drives. And, uh, and later outboards and stern drives. We ran a Mandela called uh, Grit and won first inboard. Uh, a number of years in the nine hour. The guy who owned the hull, Jack Rex, and drove, 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 drove the boat was a CPA. And for a number of years, he, he bought, bought some of the stock in the company and was part of this company for a number of years. And I got it off Jack. I mean, basically, he laid it out for me. He was your de facto he, accounting 101. He was a genius <laughs> accounting individual. Just, and a hell of a boat racer. <laughs> but we, we had a, a double whammy in early 80s. We had, had uh, well, 73, 74, we had a fuel crunch mm -hmm. that crippled the automotive, especially the aftermarket. And uh, then 80, 81, we, we, we had two recessions back to back. Uh, that took, took out the boat business. Uh, I wanted to get move into this diesel thing. Jack was here at the time. Jack Rex was the man's name. And uh, he, he wanted to remain in the boat business. So we se separated our ways and he op opened Rex Marine. And the recession uh, it, it took him. He, here's a piece of advice. Don't get too emotionally involved in what you do. I mean, I get emotionally involved if we win. Uh, it's a rush. And if we, if we come out with a product that really kicks ass, 
and we know it kicks ass because we test all the other stuff, that's more important and, and a bigger rush to me because everybody involved in developing, everybody who works here celebrates those victories. So that's okay emotionally. Uh, but don't, don't fall in love with a product that's going to, we're in we're in the demand will be gone in a year or two. Yeah, don't be afraid to diversify. Don't be don't be afraid afraid of the future. All right. So, well, uh, thank you so much for your time today, Gail, and uh, for Gail Banks. It's I'm, an honor, you guys. <laughs> well, it's an honor for I us really to be here with it. you as well. Uh, for Gail Banks and the uh, Stephen Young Executive Network live chat, I'm yeah. Sean Holman, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you.